we have Heather Bryant and Veronica Darer to share the results of their assessment of two sections of the first year writing course and illustrate shifts in student writing skills to discuss the role of instructor student dialogues in blended learning. My name is Veronica Darer from Wilson College, and um, believe it or not, I'm in the Spanish department, but I do the assessment for the blended learning um, project. Yeah, good morning. I'm Heather Bryant, also at Wesley College, and I devise the study. I teach in the writing program, and it's exciting to be here because my daughter actually graduated from Ben Mar, so <laughs> you are good memories, so welcome. Yes, and we just wanted to thank the Blended um, Learning um, grant uh, for facilitating this uh, presentation. So at Wellesley College, we have first year writing classes, and they are capped at about 15 students. They're all for first year students. And I wanted to test out something I've been thinking about a lot. I'm also a writer and a poet. Whether writing by hand actually is different from typing. There are a lot of new studies showing that there are differences. And I wanted to explore a little bit in my class what they were. So the course title or the course field was looking at the way selfies alter our perception of reality. Are we starting to see ourselves in front of everything as opposed to looking out? So that was kind of the, the umbrella topic of the course. We read a variety of traditional and non-traditional read things like Kim Kardashian's book, Selfish, <laughs> um, which has very little print, and Pride and Prejudice. So it was, a, it was a new course. I taught it for the first time. And we met twice a week for 70 minutes. And as I said, they were all first-year students. So they were kind of a perfect test audience for this project. And again, what I wanted to see was what actually <coughs> happens when students wrote by hand, which they're less accustomed to doing now, and when they blog. So Every week they had an assignment where they wrote in a notebook half the class. One of my classes, I had two sections. One class wrote in a notebook, the other class wrote in a blog. Uh, so what we did is uh, we had we were very lucky that semester, which was um, a year ago, that we had courses in the humanities that was the same course taught by the same instructor. And so we could uh, compare blended learning, uh, courses that use blended learning, and courses that did not use blended learning. So here's one of the three studies. Another one was in a Japanese classroom, and the other one was in another writing course. So that's a presentation for another time. So what we did is we divided, um, uh, both courses had to write paragraphs at the beginning of the semester of a definition of what a selfie is. And then they wrote a definition at the end of the semester. Uh, we tried to make our variables very tight. So uh, both classes hand wrote the definitions and both classes had 10 minute limit uh, at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester. But of course the people who wrote by hand had some kind of advantage um, because they had been doing handwriting um, all the time. So we use so many types of analysis and I'm going to go through all of these. I just want to introduce the, some of you. We use word count differences between pre and post. Uh, we use comprehensibility improvement. Uh, we had a, a certain measure there. Uh, topic development improvement, uh, writing structure improvement, grammar error improvement, <coughs> And we did some word cloud comparison. So we tried to use, because it's small classes, and that's where the study is not so valid and reliable and relevant, but we tried. And so what we do is with a word count difference. And I'm going to read this, because it's all this um, quantitative stuff. So uh, we counted the number of words of both groups pre and post entries, and then calculated the difference in the number of words between each individual student's pre and post writing. By adding the total of the differences in number of words for each group, we were able to compare the two groups. And there was a significant difference. Uh, you know, uh, the group that wrote by hand wrote a lot more words than the ones that wrote um, by a, a, a lot. 
However, they have been writing by hand all semester, so that might count. And this doesn't necessarily denote uh, quality. This denoted more quantity than quality. So, um, so it was a pretty significant the difference. Um, then we had something called comprehensively improvement results. And um, so what we did is we judged all entrants for general comprehensibility. There were three people judging these, these papers. And we divided it into three levels. So we used the first level was above average comprehensibility. And what it means that when we read it, it was really easy to read and comprehend. So it had uh, good organization, flow, clear wording, recognizable main points, and other variables. Then the second level was average comprehensibility. And that's when there was a little bit, it wasn't so easy to comprehend for the same reasons. And we had to reread it a couple of times to make sure it was comprehensible to us, what the students meant. And the one is below average com comprehensibility, and there was no clue <laughs> at all what the student was saying. Uh, because again, it, it wasn't flowing and so on and so forth. So what we did is we used a point system. And I don't know how quantitatively reliable it is, but this was it. Using, we calculated the difference between the pre and the post entries of each student. For example, if the pre was assessed at average and then the post was assessed above average, we gave that student a plus point. If it was assessed, if the student had an above average and still kept the above average, we still gave them the point and so on and so forth. And what we see is um, even though there was a, a, a difference and again the comprehensibility was better for those who hand wrote it, uh, it wasn't significant. It wasn't statistically significant. And doing the same thing we did for topic development. And um, what we mean by topic development is um, the following. Uh, in topic development, we use three, three levels again. So if they had um, a topic that was clear and understandable, the second time around improved on that topic or mentioned new topics, then we gave them a plus one. If they stayed about the same, uh, then it was a, you know an average. And some of them really did not improve at all. On the contrary, there were less topics uh, mentioned in the second entry or the topic was less developed. And this really yielded really interesting results. And um, what it yielded is that people who wrote in the blog had more topic development in the second entry. Mm -hmm. uh, however, as we were talking, the people who wrote in the blog, they read each other's uh, entries uh, constantly. And even though the handwritten people also had, were supposed to read each other's entries, it wasn't that clear that they did. Now, with the blog entries, what really was interesting is that there was kind of an infection of ideas. So suddenly these students were mentioning the same sources, mentioning the same ideas, mentioning the same. So they were really paraphrasing each other. It was like a real infection of ideas, which is good and bad. Um, and we saw that a lot of the topic development was, and the new topics were pretty much the same, even though they were better. Um, and um, then we also did other assessment rubrics. <coughs> yeah, so I looked at, I'm obviously a writer, not an assessment person. So I looked at, at a little bit different things you know, with, this, with the same goal. So I looked at the things that I work on teaching the most. And I think we all know writing is hard to teach and hard to assess. And so I looked at, Sentence structure first, and I think a one to clear and elevate sentences, a two to ones that were kind of, they had some good stuff going on. I gave a three for sentences that had variety but were maybe not so organized, and then there was the four was the lowest, which was for very repetitive writing. No statistical difference. And then I looked at word choice, which is something obviously we've talked about a lot. Again, looked at something, you know, the word choice was very strong and varied and wide ranging. Then I looked at words, you know, very solid, strong, what you would expect from a first year student at a competitive college. 
And three was more constrained, kind of limited vocabulary. And the last was, was very constrained. Some students I taught, and I think we're probably all finding this, are coming out of very different high school backgrounds. And so some of them have just had very little word preparation, and that was the fourth. And most of it's a little bit mm -hmm. So then I looked at transitions, which is something I spent a lot of time teaching. And you know, obviously very strong transitions, creative, not just first, second, third type things, but actually idea transitions. No worries. And then there were transitions that were significant. Somebody was clearly trying to make a transition. Some were kind of in had a haphazard transition, some had no attention to transition. So that, those were my categories. And no statistical difference. Yes. And the other thing we tried to do is to see if there was a correlation between grammar errors in the first entry and the <coughs> second entry. And guess what? The errors that they had in the first entry, they did not have in the second entry in both classes. So there was absolutely no way to compare. Uh, and we tried to do a word cloud, and I haven't done um, much with this, but on the superficial level, it looks that there's not a lot of difference, but I'll, I'll look at that a little bit more, we'll look at that a little bit more, um, you know, as, as time goes on. So, so down the road, the, you know, one of the big reasons for the study, for my interest in the study was, A, to see what would happen, which is a mixed bag, and B, to think about my own teaching and how I can balance writing with paper and pencil, actual in-class writing time, which seems to be sometimes very valuable, with you know, blog writing or online writing out of class. And I, I think one of my other goals was to help students understand the differences between the kinds of writing and the benefits of using lots of different kinds of writing um, and talking about the different skills that potentially students develop from writing by hand versus blogging. And then a larger question that Veronica alluded to is how do we look at writing that may be more private, even though they shared their notebooks, I'm not really sure they read them that carefully. It was, you know, they had to read handwriting and it was, there were a lot of obstacles to that. Whereas on a blog, they, they had access to one of those blogs they could just hop around very easily and look. So to look at how ideas germinate, um, Veronica used the word, you know, infection. And I think that's, you know, there's two sides to it. One side is infection, one side is cross-pollination. But definitely, I, I would argue potentially there was more creativity <coughs> in the notebook entries because they were more distinct and there was more distinct sense of voice. And then ultimately, the larger question, the meta question looking at how that we can look at the impact of blended learning on student learning and how in writing courses and how can it be assessed quantitatively. This was the first time I've ever done anything like this, so there was a lot to learn. So, so this is one of many studies that we have done as well, say, assessing uh, blended learning. And, uh, and it comes to the second point, and what I'm seeing in general is that unless we as professors really make it clear why we're using this technology and what we expect from students. The classroom interaction, the classroom culture really doesn't change. And luckily I've seen this in a lot of the studies I've done at Wellesley. So unless we're very you know, uh, clear and transparent of why we're using all this blended learning, it's gonna get us the same type of interaction of student, teacher, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second um, one is, uh, the fourth point is, the, one of the studies was uh, testing the difference between public and private. And this was in the other writing course. And it came out that uh, in the one that did it for uh, private in, in, in the classroom had a much better presentation uh, rating than the ones that were in public domain in, uh, on a blog. Um, I still have to look at it more carefully and see what happens. But the problem is we have small classes. Um, the numbers don't give for statistically significant um, 
you know, and, and that's what's so hard in the small humanities classroom. So we're trying all kinds of ways to measure this quantitatively. If you have any ideas or any suggestions, just please, you know, write to us if anybody is doing anything that we haven't done. Um, I've done things with video and things like that. Please just contact us because we would love to engage further into really evaluating and assessing. And, yes. Um, just offer a suggestion. I, I think this is a wonderful study. Uh, we're going to do a bill of um, iPads with pencils, so the students can write, hand write with the Mobility app. And that way you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. And it might make an interesting follow-on study for you folks, you know, to see if, um, uh, you know, having students handwrite some things. And, uh, but so you then you have the advantage of the technology there that they can keep the files, share the files, even though they are handwritten. So That's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Again, and we've done studies with video in the classroom. So if you're interested, I mean, it's other studies, but the results were, again, very interesting. And so maybe it'll be for another time to, to to share this with you. So yeah. I hope this was helpful in some way. Thank, Thank you. you.